Welcome to Tales of the Lexus Melbourne Cup. This is episode one and we've got two legends of the Lexus Melbourne Cup to have a chat to and also two of the biggest characters in the history of Australia's greatest race. It is with great pleasure that I welcome in Jimmy, the Pumper Cassidy and Greg Hall. G'day gents, how are you going? Terrific. Hello, Michael. Um, hello, G. Hello, hello, James. Hello, Mickey Blue Eyes. <laughs> uh, it's great to reminisce about the great moments of the Melbourne Cup where you two are uh, indelibly forever linked into the history books. Jim, uh, Pump, uh, Jimmy Pumper Cassidy, two Melbourne Cups, Kiwi and also Might and Power, and for you, G, Sub-Zero. We're going to talk about that famous Might and Power finish in a moment, but Greg... To you first, how did that win on Sub Zero change your life in the Melbourne Cup? Well, I mean, I can only answer for myself, not Jimmy E1 too, but um, it's a hard question that, and Jim might agree with me. It's, um, I don't know whether it changed your life, but it, it puts you in the history books, and it was the pinnacle, mate. And um, I took a lot of work, a lot of hard hours, left school. And, 12, Jaquita Lodge of 14, $5 a week for seven years, half a Sunday afternoon off, and Jimmy knows the apples up at three o'clock in the morning. And obviously it's, it's a goal that every jockey wants to win. I don't know if it changes your life, but it does change your life in, in, in a different sense, as you're saying, Michael, is um, it changes your life on the other side of the fence. If you I reckon you changed yours a bit, G. You wouldn't have fitted into them same Lycra silks that you wore on Sub Zero. Looks like you got a Lycra shirt on today. <laughs> I, I, I didn't wear. I wasn't. I wasn't chained died, Pumper. I didn't wear Lycra I silks. You, I thought you must have contacted him to get that Lycra shirt to fit into. Mate, that's what happens when you go to the gym all the, the time. The Melbourne buddy. Cup's changed you, G. You put on a couple <laughs> kilos since the last season. I'll tell you what, you lost a few fruit of stairs since I've seen you too. <laughs> they called you, they used to call him Mudguard, shiny on top and sit underneath. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you haven't lost it. Love no, it. I love, love you. It. I love you too, mate. <laughs> Oh, uh, we're there, we're there at times, Michael. We're there at times. Well, the, the cup has linked you two for life, and you've become great mates before, but even more so after because of that famous 1997 cup. Isn't that right, Jimmy? Oh, 100%. G was uh, when I met, first met G in the in the uh, middle 80s, early 80s, and we rode together in so many great races, and uh, including so many Melbourne Cups. So uh, we've been great, become partners uh at the races you spend so much time together and uh yeah been great mates and to find out a finish like we did in one of the great races in australia was magic remus on the outside might and power the leader Doremus trying hardest coming at him might and power and Doremus. Doremus getting the might and power they hit the line photo oh nothing between them Doremus or might and power in a close go jimmy your memory of of that finish first of all when g went up in the irons did you think you'd won or did you know G had gone off too early? No, look, I thought I'd got beat. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, G was a master in tight finishes. He could lift them. Uh, and I honestly thought he got me. I just kept my head down and thought to myself, uh, he's got me, you know. He's waving, saluting as you do when you win the big ones. But I later found out there was a, I thought there was some lady in row 42B in the top grandstand that he was waving to. So when I said to Lexi, what number's in the frame? He said, pump, you got it, number three. I tell you what, if I've ever seen a jockey nearly fall through his underpants and hang himself, it was G. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have I got to hear this one? Great memories. And uh, I honestly thought you'd beat me, G, but... Uh, my good, my good mates at you rode for Rod Russell and Keith Biggs. So obviously owned Doremus. I had a lot of fun with them over the years. So it was nice to to have the cup on my mantelpiece that they could drink out of. <laughs> hey, gee, do you do you remember that moment when Letsy told you you hadn't won? Well, actually, that's not quite the truth because when I went past, Letsy said to me, "You won, you won, right?" And I actually thought I did have Jimmy, and I was I'm actually. Jimmy and I, going back to what Jimmy was saying over the 70s, 80s and 90s, it wasn't all beer and Skittles between it. A bit older than me. I never got here till the late 80s. Yeah, I know. Oh, I'll let you in here. 
Thank Some God. Years on me, but like Yeah, and um, but Jimmy and I had in the eighties and nineties were very competitive, and uh, we had plenty of clashes. And but after racing, or before we finished, we become great mates and that. But we had our ups and downs. But um, yeah, I remember the moment, and uh, and naturally I thought I won. And I'm not a bloke that normally does that, actually, but. Um, uh, it was one of your best. One of your best. And you know what? One you know what I love least. about a Mickey? Blue eyes. <laughs> I get more mileage out of that race than I do out of Subby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because one of Jimmy's famous lines is, oh, I've never seen a bloke so happy to run second. <laughs> it was the best best performance I've ever seen. Yeah, you, I was very surprised you didn't get a you didn't get a crack in America on stage yeah, for that one. What, what, what was it like when you went back in the jockey's room? Who you asking? Oh, man? amazing! G was sit, G was sitting there crying in his hanky, and I was fucking jumping up and down. <laughs> well, it was one of the most iconic Melbourne Cups, and for you, Pumper, the pressure was immense after Might and Power's demolition job in the Caulfield Cup. Did you feel it that top day? Yeah, look, I did. He was uh, he was well back. The expectations of him to do something similar to what he'd done in the Caulfield Cup, but that was never going to happen. It was a different race. Uh, he'd never run two mile. So the pressure was on, and plus he'd never been a horse lead all the way and win the Melbourne Cup. So I sort of had to get the clock in the head right and had to be patient. And I didn't take a lot of rides that day because I was pretty focused. And uh, to come out and lead, to get him to relax, I remember clearly we got to the 2000 and about the 1800 and there were a couple of people very close to the running rail and i spotted them and actually moved off the running rail sort of about a horse after that melbourne cup i seen the replay where we seen people running out on the track coming to the 300 and uh i don't know how g missed him because he was coming out wide he might have got that protester but look great moment great pressure and it was nice bob of the head to uh obviously fall my way uh I'd come back from a bit of controversy. I'd won the Caulfield Cup, and then obviously expectations of him doing that were were going to be slim. And uh, I laughed. I was standing in the mountain yard, and prior to the Caulfield Cup, Jack said, "Whatever you do, don't lose." <laughs> I didn't see that Melbourne Cup day. Did <laughs> you tell a gym that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, look, uh, great moment. Something I never forgot. Uh, the dream was to ride in the Melbourne Cup to win two. Um, Unbelievable feeling, massive feeling. Kiwis was probably one of the greatest Melbourne Cups I have ever seen, to be honest. Uh, I was lucky enough to be on him. The Jazz on the outside, Noble Comment, the centre, Kiyamare. No peer running on. Noble Comment on the inside, and Mr Jazz. Noble Comment takes the lead. Kiwi! Kiwi will beat them all. It's come from last. Kiwi! Kiwi's won the Melbourne Cup. A blistering performance. Kiwi coming from second last to beat Noble Comment and Mr Jazz in the Melbourne Cup. To see a performance like that from a thoroughbred in such a high-pressure race, um, to round up the other 23 the way he did was, to this day, 38 years later, incredible. It was incredible, your two Melbourne Cup wins, leading throughout on might and power and coming from last on Kiwi. Did you think Kiwi in 83, uh, as a young, unknown to all of us in Australia, as a 20-year-old, you had any chance coming to the home turn? Look, I'd ridden him the same way, and the thing that flabbergasted me, and it, it still has, not many people have ever gone back and had a look at his last run in New Zealand prior to the Melbourne Cup. Now, there's probably uh, advantages and disadvantages looking at it because he hadn't had a run for a month prior to the Melbourne Cup, so they said he couldn't win. But the Smarties never let him get out from 11 to 1. He was there for a month and a half. So he didn't open up 30 to 1 to become 11 to 1. He opened up 11 to 1 and he started at 11 to 1. And I remember that because I had something on him. But anyhow, that's another story. <laughs> but his last run prior to the Melbourne Cup, he carried nine stone. He won on a track probably similar to probably Werribee or Canterbury in Sydney. He carried nine stone. He came from two lengths past and run a course record. So he dropped, him, he dropped from nine stone to 52 kilos in the Melbourne Cup. He'd had one crack at two miles and won. He was having his second crack at two miles, and he mm. won that too. I asked, G what it did to him winning the Melbourne Cup. But for a young Kiwi 20-year-old, how did it change your life? 
Uh, to be honest, my, if I never rode another horse after that day, I would have been happy because my dream come true. I rode and won and I won it. I had two rides in it and won it on my second occasion. So if I never rode again, I was would have been happy. But obviously I did. And it opened a lot of doors. It gave me the chance to come to Sydney in 84 to to ride for Bob LaPointe, Robert Sanks, which they set up Nebo Lodge to take on Tommy Smith. And... Look, I, I was punching around six days a week in New Zealand, driving seven hours to race meetings, and then all of a sudden I won the Melbourne Cup. A year later, I'm sitting up in Sydney uh, riding for some of the greatest trainers that I never thought I'd throw a leg over a horse on for them, meaning Bart Cummings, Tommy yeah. Smith, Colin Hayes. So my life, it did change a lot. It, it, I've had a lot of doors slam in my life, but by gee, I was very happy when that one opened. Gee, had you heard of a young Jimmy the Pumper Cassidy before Kiwi? No, I hadn't. No, I hadn't. But but I will say this on that note, while my memory is fresh, is um, about um, Jimmy, I call him James, but um, not many people let her do that. But um, I always let G call me James. The, he always comes out with the James Arthur when he's a bit annoyed with me, though. It's like your mother. It's like my mother calling me Gregory. I'm in trouble then. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but one thing about Jimmy was um, even going back to that famous race with Martin and Power and Doremus, and we all know the result. We get that, but um, how he led all the way and he got annoyed by his brother and other horses. That was nothing to do with me, but. Um, um, I look at it that, um, you know, sadly, Subby's passed away, but uh, I look at it that I remember Scobie briefly said to me when I got beat, I was down and out and he was at the races, Michael and, he, and Jimmy, he said to me, and he said, listen here, son, he said, he said, I'd give it all back what he'd done with his English derbies and everything. He said, you've won one, I've run second in one. And when I look at it, I look at it this way, that... Um, like I said, in in the room, Jimmy and I could be mates and take the piss out of each other and blah, blah, blah. But come race day, we we're, were pretty we're fearless and um, took risk and all that. But um, it's, a, it's a Melbourne Cup. That, that, that actually gave me goosebumps when you said that, G. Give me goosebumps when you were saying that he said he'd give all his derbies and everything back for a Melbourne Cup. I've heard a lot of jockeys say that, Michael. It's incredible. Mm. Uh, that's what it means to a jockey, really. Like, and I won't interrupt, G. But there, yeah, that give me goosebumps thinking of that because. Thank you, mate. Uh, but I, I was just—I I don't want to push you too too hard, Jimmy, because I love you. But um, that race to me, you know, a lot of people say to me they never bring up Sub Zero or they get, Oh, you're the bloke that was going like this over the line and all that, and you thought you won. And and, um, and I look back at it, and after I spoke to Scoby and I spoke to Ron Hutchison and. And they just said some would give it all back, and they wrote everything in Europe and all that. But and neither of them, done, neither of them, done what Jimmy and I done. But the way I look at that race is Jimmy is the two great horses, and I'm not really like this, but they were two champion jockeys and two champion race horses, and it was a bob of the head, and. It was just a beautiful race to ride in. It was the most beautiful race. It was the most beautiful race I ever rode in. And that's win, lose or draw. Greg, you've got a beautiful picture of a, of a grey behind you. And you were partnered with the most famous grey uh, racing's probably ever seen, the mighty Sub-Zero, who we'll talk about his deeds after he won the Cup. Uh, because it almost overshadows he's more remembered for what sub zero has done post racing than winning that 92 melbourne cup and a lot of people forget your ride it was one of the great melbourne cup rides but how vivid is your memory of that day g oh it's like yesterday michael he drew 15 and um there was not a hope in the world as jimmy knows the way i ride going out of the straight the first time it was impossibility that g was going to be three deep and um Superimposed was back inside me and better loose, or whoever it was, anyway. I got one off the fence and by a fluke, the end across was back on the inside, and um, and that didn't worry me, but that's the way it worked out. But um, he's he's well, when you say so, you said that before, Michael, did he change me life? He did, but um, 
and I'm not pushing my own barrier, but it, it took a good ride and it took a good trainer and it took a good horse to win on that day because he didn't beat any mugs. Greg Hall has raced to the front on Sub-Zero. He goes for home in the cup and he might have a run. He's three in front. Vianda across Castle Town trying hard, but it's the Grey's Cup. Sub-Zero holding Vianda across at bay and Sub-Zero wins the Melbourne Cup by two lengths. Second, Vianda across a length and a half away. Third, Castle Town. He wasn't the best horse I rode, but he's, he's the greatest horse I ever rode. And um, But what a life he had. Like He won a Melbourne Cup, so he's, he's a legend. I just happened to be the lucky one to ride him. Well, well, well I beg to differ that because if someone else had a rode him, they probably would have sat three deep with no cover. But anyway, and then he became a clerk of the course and he's leading Jimmy and I back in when we win a Melbourne Cup or whatever race it were. If it was first, he'd lead them back in. Every time he led me back in, it was mostly Jimmy and I winning every race. I'd give him a pat and all that, you know. And then after that, when he had to retire from that, being a clerk of the course, he, he's very iconic, this horse. He, he's won a Melbourne Cup, so he's in the history book. If he was a famous clerk of the course, and Jimmy knows taking us to the barracks and bringing us back how beautiful he was. And then he became a people's horse. And he would go to hospitals, schools, up in lifts, pubs, clubs, schools. And I was just saying today that, um, and, I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Jimmy, um, is it's unusual for a jockey to keep in touch with their Melbourne Cup winners because they've got a business to run and they've got a job to do, right? But I was fortunate enough to win the Melbourne Cup. He retired at five. He'd leave me back in when I won. And then when he retired from the park of the course, I'd retired and I'd done a lot of gigs with him and went to lots of schools and hospitals and that with him. and. Six months ago, eight months ago, I went up to Bendigo and said, there wasn't one year went by, Jimmy or Michael, that, I, that I'd never seen him several times, which is very unusual. And he was a bit like a, a elaborate, like a puppy dog to me, right? I remember when I went to Bendigo, Jim, and he's got a, he's got a drip and he got the needle in his neck and all that. And, and Graham even said, even Graham's passed away as well as well, we all know. And, um, he said, he doesn't do that, G, you know. He just put his head over my neck and give me a kiss and a cuddle. It was freezing. And I must say, G, I was never lucky enough to ride him. Uh, one of the great champions. But I tell you what, he's the most champion also I've ever seen. Mm. He is, mate. I never rode him, but he was the most champion. Like, he was just a champion in everything he'd done uh, to help kids out, to perform, and... Uh, he, he deserved all the accolades he got. Uh, icons and legends of the Melbourne Cup, uh, just like you two gentlemen, uh, Jimmy Pumper Cassidy and Greg Hall, great to reminisce about your wins and uh, your time and promotion for the Lexus Melbourne Cup as well. And, gee, you're looking sharp, aren't you? Who, hey, me or Jim? Thank you. Gee, you're stunning today, and I love that lycra, mate. Mate. How do I get you all right? Send me one up. Hey, Thank you, boys. Mate. Great to catch up. Great to see you looking so well and enjoy the build-up to this year's Lexus Melbourne Cup. Yes. My word. Jim, Jimmy, I'll give you a call, mate. Thanks, Michael, for the Please interview. Do, Lovely, to talk. Lovely to talk to you, James. Ring a ding ding. Yeah. Give us a ring. <laughs> Don't worry about the big G. <laughs>